Hallelujah. Not everything you want, but do you got everything you need? Amen, Amen somebody? My God will give you all your needs, and every now and then he'll give you some of the things you want, because that's the kind of God he is. Amen, somebody? Amen? But he wants you to learn to be content with what you have. Amen. And so we thank God we got everything we need. I tried to call you on Tuesday, Jasmine, because I was just driving, minding my business, and that song came on, and all I saw was my young folk. I've been listening to that song ever since it got started, but now it's special. Amen. That's my favorite youth song. Amen. I was like, oh, you know how I go. I don't got no, I don't got no, I've been in the car. People are like, ain't something wrong with him. I, be, I got everything. <laughs> be driving. I try to call Jasmine. She got three numbers or two. I must have called the one that she screamed because it was like uh, one of them uh, electronic voices came on. I said, I ain't messing with that, man. I was calling to say hey to Jasmine and be like, I got everything I need. <laughs> but we give God the praise. We give God the honor. And we give God the glory. It look like y'all trying to break the Guildfield surface or service uh, 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 record. And so the sad thing is they gave me the mic. Nah, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Tony, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. I'm trying, man. But um, we give God praise. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for our young folk. For the leaders of young folk. Amen. And young folk, I'm saying this personally to y'all. There is a word from the Lord. Say there's a word, there's a word. For, me. for me. From the no, no, not for me, for you. Say there's a word, there's a word. For, me. for me. Point to you. I'm looking at you. That's right. Point say point to yourself. Say for me. For me. Somebody drop their jewelry. You wanna grab that real quick? I'm gonna pause. It look expensive. That's yours? Yeah. That's yours? Okay. Somebody jewelry fell out there. So now point to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's a word. There's for you, all the young folk, all the young folk. All. Now point to the older folks. Say, there's a word for you. The older folk. You're pointing over here. Inside the room. Y'all scared? Y'all scared? Say, there's a word for you. Now, now everybody say, now get your word. Amen, 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 amen. Um, we're reading from Psalms 137 verses 1 through 4. Uh, an amazing psalm. And and I do want to sort of set the tone. It's Black History Month, and I didn't get a chance to do uh, the things that I really wanted to do and felt led to do because we had so many other things that we had to do. Amen? But it was concluded that Black History Month didn't start in February, and it won't end in February. That's right, That's right. We're going to run throughout the course of the year, and we're going to stay with this. Amen, somebody? Because I'm tired of putting the dot uh, in a big old geographical picture with all these races and we just put a dot and say that's our moment. No, that's not it. That's not it. And God's going to show you some things in his word. Watch this young folk that even some of the grown folk don't know. It's going to get deep. Hey, that's right. Uh-huh. She, yeah, yes, your mama don't know. You're going to say, mama, you didn't know that one. Pastor, they won't get mad and say, pastor said you didn't even know that. So they, they can't, you know how you, I, I try to tell my mom what to do. It never worked out. But you can tell them, pastor said, pastor said. It's going to be a, a great point. And so I didn't get a chance to do what I really felt led to do because we had so many things that we had to focus on. So we're going to continue it. But this psalm captures the essence of where I think the Lord is going to allow me to take you and we are going to go on a journey. The journey starts today, young folk. And by the time we get to next year, you'll understand why I preach this message right here. I like that kind of stuff. That's some, that's, that's some prophetic stuff right there. Make it sound like the preacher know what he's talking about, huh, man? <laughs> Amen. So the, the, the word reads, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the people said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And the people says, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And the people of God says, how shall we in a strange land? Amen, 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 amen. Let me pray. Father, I come in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share with my young folk. I pray that whatever you've deposited in me, I'm able to deposit in them. 
And I pray, Lord God, that our older members get the overflow. But let the young folk know that they need to pay very close attention. This is really serious. It's really important. And if they pray and if they get this, Lord God, it's going to bless their lives beyond measure. And so I pray that you take me deep in your well of wisdom. Bring me up so up with your anointing that I might be able to speak a relevant word that touches young people's heart. I don't want to lose them in translation. I don't want to lose them, Lord God, with complex words. I don't want to lose them, Lord God, with complex adult themes. I want to be able to speak a message that reaches right to where they are to let them know how valuable, how powerful, and how important they are yes. to you. And so I thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. I, I, I sent this to my wife late and I needed to add something on. It's your story, your song, your savior. Say that with me. Say your story, your, story. your, song, your song, your savior. Your savior. Say it's my story, it's my, story. My, song, my song, my savior. Because it's personal. God is a personal God. The one thing I've learned in Guilford Baptist Church since I was just a little older than y'all when I got here is it, it became my story. I learned to sing the songs of Zion up in here. Sad to say, I needed to do some things, so I removed the pews. I probably should have removed them pews because we sang over here all the time. Yeah. Amen? And I removed the pews because it was necessary to make space. And we're going to move them things too because it's necessary to make space. That's a sidebar. But, but, but I remember singing the songs of Zion over there. Yeah. I remember. Here I am. I ain't an old man, but I'm an older man, right? Am I, I ain't. I ain't, I ain't old right now. You wouldn't call me old, would you? Chuck your shoulders right. All right. And I remember them songs. I remember junior night. We were rehearsed on Saturdays. And me, Mike, and Big Jeff, we were all six feet, two and three, and a whole lot thinner than he is right now. I'm just, just going to this side. And, and junior would, we would do like go over four songs. I mean, he's just going. I'm sitting there now. I, to this day, I don't, and y'all got to catch this. This is, I don't remember. He just went over the song, and we'd do it and go over the parts, and then the next day we came in and, and sang, and I knew every word. I don't know how. I, re, I can't remember a whole lot now, but I, I, I remembered all those words, and we would get up there, and then they'd be like, Jeff, Tony, Mike, because we used to drown the crowd. Because the Lord gripped our hearts because God understood what we were up against as young men out here. And so he was making sure he did an extra grip on us because it was a whole lot calling our names. Amen, somebody? My God, my God. And, and, and But when we came to church on Sunday, we understood that it wasn't just any old story. It was our story. I developed a story in my time in Guilford. He's developed a story. Uh, um, um, everybody got a story. And unfortunately, the world has come to grips with the fact that they won't tell us when we can talk about our story. Yeah. Oh, you can have it. Um, when I was your age, I remember being in elementary school. It was Black History Week. Yeah. We got a week. They said, "Now nah, we're going to give you a promotion. We're going to make it Black History Month. And then I met Jesus, my Savior. He said, no, we're going to make it Black History every day, all day, everywhere you go. Come on, somebody. Because it's my story to tell. You don't tell me how to tell my story, when to tell my story, how long I can tell my story, and you can't add anything into my story. Why? Because it's whose story? It's your story. It's your story. And um, so I want to tell a little bit about my story. And so I'm going to ask First Lady if she can kind of run the slides. Now, before she runs the slides, I hope this doesn't come across as narcissistic. What that means is I'm over, you know, over my, I'm like too into myself and it's all about, but in it, you, you, we, we, that pretty smile. You, I don't know what's behind that. You, you, okay, anyway. It ain't about me, but because it's my story and I want to help you understand your story in the context of being here at Guilford Baptist Church, I just want to play some things, right? Because what I wanted to do, my ultimate aim, uh, Sister Carol Lita, was I was going to interview Reverend Knight. I was going to interview Mother Broom. I was y'all see Mother Brune all the time, Reverend Knight, Mother Brune. I was going to interview um, Mother, um, Sister, uh, 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 Taylor, not Taylor, I'm going to say Blanche Taylor, Sister, Sister Bradley, who's 96, she'll be 97 in October, so I think she's probably the oldest living Guildfield member, amen? 90, almost 100 years old, and then Reverend Knight, who's 94, and then the final one was Sister Adele Peoples, who's 80. So we got these people who are almost a century, y'all know what a century mean, right? 
A hundred, that's crazy, right? Uh, we got folk uh, that's a hundred years old. A whole in the streets say they a whole ball, a whole ball, ball, a ball. Out, had to go there, had to go there. Little street. Chris, Chris getting itchy over here. You got a ball, you got a ball fifty. <laughs> that's some other talk, cold talk, cold talk. But 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 almost a hundred years old. We, we don't, I, I love Dr. King, and I'm going to show you something about Dr. King, and I've met some great, uh, Marion Burry, you know, he had his issues, but he's still one of my American heroes, amen? amen. He didn't handle his demons well, but he's still one of my, you know why he didn't handle his demons well? Because folks stopped praying for him. They was praising and putting him on a pedestal and forgot that when God calls somebody great out your midst and they start rising up, you know what your job to do? Is pray for him because as the leader goes, so goes the people. Even our sister Rita, Rita went to, went to us in the 70s. Rita went and graduated from high school, went to school for free. It was Federal City College, got a degree, and went into the government. Y'all follow me on this and worked 42 years and retired with the best pension that you can retire in this country until they came up with a new system. And guess how she did that? Through Marion Burry. Through Marion Burry. Amen. Marion Burry, so he's one of my greatest heroes. I remember being 13 years old. I'm just, just throwing people out there because it's my story. Can I tell my story? Can I tell that's my story? Right, right, because, because I remember being 13 and my brother and sister came with these people. I said, what's that? They said, a check. I'm like, what's a check? They said, we're going to go to the bank and we're going to give them this and they're going to do that. They go, how much money? They say, right here. I said, 130. I said, that's a lot of money. How'd you get that? This man named Marion Burry. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Any Marion Burry recipients in here, raise your hands. Look around, young folk. Look around. It ain't just my story. It's a whole lot of stories in here. Amen, sister. Amen. And, 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 and I started, I, I got work ethic. I got an understanding on what it is to go to a place, do what somebody tell me to do, learn how to develop a skill, and that thing is still working. Amen, somebody? We got a whole lot of young men on the streets because nobody can pull their men and get them disciplined enough to wake up every day and go to a thing called J-O-B and work and learn how to take care of themselves before they stop having all these babies out. I'm sorry, I just, I just went off the cliff. I just went off the cliff. But, but, but my story was I learned. And, and I remember that. I remember Mary and Barry. I was going to interview those back, back, I said, Reverend Knight, uh, uh, Sister um, uh, Mother Broom, uh, Sister Adel Peoples, and, and Mother Bradley. And the interview was going to ask them questions about their life and their history. Because when you talk to somebody who was here almost 100 years ago, America was a whole different place. Yeah. See, when they was your age and, and a little younger than me, they couldn't even vote. They didn't even have the right to vote. They had to live in the country. I'm going to get to the scripture. They had to live in the country, get up with some sense of dignity, go try to work any old job they could get because, because you didn't have the right to vote. You weren't considered a full-fledged citizen. They had to do what they had to do. But you know what them folk had? They had pride. They had dignity. They had perseverance. And they took the crappiest jobs they had and worked to make sure there was food on the table. And stuck with their families. And then prosperity came. That's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. I did an interview with Reverend Knight, but I couldn't record it. And here's what he said to me. Give me your ages. Robin. When Reverend Knight was seven years old, he lived in Tallahassee, Florida. He walked to school barefooted. Now, now, in your mind, it's hard to conceive. It's, it's hard to believe in my mind. <laughs> but he went up and went to school every day with no shoes on his feet. Can y'all, that sound crazy, right? Don't that sound crazy? Because the world y'all live in, we, we, you came into it. I came into it with shoes. You came into it with shoes. But when he was born, his mom and daddy couldn't work because they was called sharecroppers. They could only work on land that was owned by other people, and they would have to gather up so much weight, and depending on how much weight they get, they would get just enough, and the people wouldn't pay them in money all the time. They'd give them food for their family, so they couldn't get money to buy shoes, but watch the determination. This man went to school every day, and he said he remembered one day he cried. He said he, was, he would walk from the country all the way through the city. And when you get to the city, before you get to the school, he would see the white kids in their nice shoes and clothes. He said he would cry. He told me this. He said he would cry. He said, but thank God. When he got about 12 years old, he jumped on his bike and rolled up to the barbershop. And it was a man named Mr. Ellis. 
and Mr. Ellis was a barbershop owner because that was one shoe shine and barbershop were one of the things that black men could respectfully own. And he went in there and said, Mr. Ellis, I need a job. Mr. Ellis, he looked him up and down and said, what do you want? He said, I want to learn how to shine shoes. He said, all right. And he showed him how to shine shoes. And three years later, he said he became one of the best shoe shiners. And Mr. Ellis showed him how to cut hair. And by the time he was 17, ready to graduate high school, because now he got shoes on his feet. Somebody say shoes on his feet. Oh, come on, somebody. I ain't telling y'all what I heard. I'm telling y'all what I know. And he say he was 17. He say he was the best shoe shine in the city. And he said he was a master barber, and he's about to graduate high school. He said, Mr. Ellis, say, son, uh, you, you need to do something with your life. He said, what can I do? He said, my parents ain't got no money. He says, won't you join the military? And Reverend Knight, I wish I had all these pictures. He joined the military, and he was in the military for four years. And then when he got out the military, and I saw his picture. Here's a crate. Y'all see the picture? If you go to his house, this will blow you away. It's any, uh, anybody else saw that picture? You go there, I'm mean, talking about a sharp, scrapping, handsome man. That, that Bama looked just like Colton. <laughs> I was like, is that Colton? Anybody, am, am I telling the truth, Georgetta? I was like, is that Colton? Look just like Colton. When Maddie, watch this, when Maddie was young, she looked like, no, she, she looked like her granddaughter, Nikki. And when, and when, I mean, it was like, it's like crazy. Genetics are crazy. And I look and I say, wow, but watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm distracted because this is real stuff. I'm just telling my story because they're part of my story. So Mr. Ellis, he went back after the military. He had, you know, uh, college tuition money. He had housing allowance because that was one of the great venues and avenues that military pro provided for black men. It gave them a, a platform to be able to have choices and options. And he went back because he was such a loyal man. Said, Mr. Ellis, I'm back. I did what you said. I want to work for Mr. Ellis. Say, son, no, 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 no. You got to go to college. You got to do better. And he went to Tallahassee. I mean, he went to, uh, 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 what is it, Florida A&M in Tallahassee, one of the top black colleges in the, in the country. He went there and graduated as an accountant. Around his second year, though, y'all follow me, he on his front porch. He told me this. He's doing his homework. And he said, this pretty young thing walked by. <laughs> He told him, I promise you, he told me just like I'm telling you. He said he up there, you know, adding up and doing ledgers. And he said this pretty young thing walked by. And he said he kind of know that she was walking by around the same time every day. I said, what you do, Ray? He said, I followed her to the store. <laughs> got down to the store and somewhere he got the nerve. And she said to him, you got to come and meet my daddy. And her daddy was a pastor. <laughs> come on, somebody. You better tell you know the story. And he said, okay. And he went and met her dad. And the dad gave him three rules. Take care of my daughter. Go to church. And you better get you a job. Amen, somebody? Amen. And he said he graduated. And then he moved to uh, Savannah, Georgia. He moved to Savannah, Georgia and got a job. But eventually he came up here. That's when they had Ann. Ann was a baby. They had her. And then Teresa. And then he had an opportunity to come up here and work for the Department of Commerce. Where he did 42 years. And he said, all the man Mr. Ellis told him was, pass it along. Tell others, help others. When I was 16 years old, I was homeless. My mother got put out of her place because we had one of them fathers who didn't handle his business. God bless his soul. He's gone to be with the Lord. He and I reconciled, so I don't want to put spit dirt on his, uh, spit on his uh, grave. And we were homeless. But by that time, I got connected with Gilfield. That's when I used to come in here and sing songs. And I used to come here when Pat Sutton had that bus. I made sure I caught that early morning ride to Guilford because I was going to get me some breakfast on Sunday morning. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Can I just give you my story? Amen. Got a little bit of grits, some sausage, piece of bacon, scrapple, amen, a biscuit. Yeah. And if I told Shirley a good joke, I'd get another piece of, another piece of bacon. Yeah. I learned to tell jokes real good, bro. I learned. <laughs> And then at least two Sundays out of the month, we would do afternoon programs. And me, Mike, and Jeff would sneak back in that room where they got all the stuff. Because we was too, we, they give me a little plate, we get us two plates and go back there and be eating up, man. And then I remember when we'd be going home on that big yellow school bus, big old yellow bus, the, yeah, the one, and, and Pastor Sutton would pull that bus over, er, open up that door, and everybody would be like, let's go. I'm like, what they going to do? Say, Pastor going to take us to McDonald's. Now, you know where I came from. We looked at McDonald's. If your friend has some fries, you might got a couple. Pastor will take us in there, pull out a big wad, and I'm like, what's going to say? Man, he's going to let you get anything you want. I say, anything? And back in the end, where anything was, give me that Big Mac. <laughs> give me a big, big, 
can I get a Big Mac? They said, you can get a Big Mac. And then we start telling our friends, man, we got a pass. All of a sudden, they start filling that bus up, boy. <laughs> we, we thought we, we, they thought they was coming to get McDonald's, but we end up getting an encounter with Jesus. Amen, somebody? And I remember coming in here. Now, I'm a, I don't want to throw my thing off. And Reverend Knight was a chairman of the deacon board, and he was up here. And the service was getting this high. Hallelujah! Look at this, y'all. That's kind of high right there. I'm, I can't do it like, yeah, I dunk on you, though. I can't do it. But this dude would jump about this high in the air. And me and Jeff was ball players. Like, man, we think about about 35, 40 inch vertical. That bama can dunk. But he wasn't trying to dunk a court. He was jumping for Jesus. Amen, somebody? And we'll run up and down this church. And Reverend Crawford said, that man is filled with the Holy Ghost. I said, what does filled with the Holy Ghost mean? Come on, somebody. And I would come in here and we were singing. I remember one time we were singing in here and Teresa was leading the song and she was singing and I was singing it. All of a sudden, I just remember something. I was like, and I just lost it. Like Edward almost lost it up there. And somebody said, just let it go. I said, what is it? He said, let it go. I said, ah, oh, stop screaming and running. And I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the reality of it is God is telling us this ain't just their story. You can play those, uh, you can start running those uh, pictures. That's, that's Collegey Woodson, the father of black history. He got a book out called Miseducation of the Negro, one of the greatest books I've read. He gives the psychology, the dichotomy, and the historical essence of why slavery is still a great part or a serious part of our psychological healing. Carter G. Woodson, baddest man that ever lived. Awesome. You got to just say, I'm going to see who Carter G. Woodson is. Say that. Because he's synonymous with black history. He's the one who, when black men couldn't get degrees, he became one of the greatest historical scholars, broke all the color barriers, and was able to bring attention to Congress that we need to reconcile well, who black people are and that we are a prize to this country. We might have came in here in the 1800, the 18th century in Jamestown as slaves, but we ain't slaves no more. We are forced to be reckoned with. We got another story we're going to tell. Our story might have started, and that right there is the bus that Rosa Parks was on at the, the museum that Jasmine and Tiara and First Lady and Michelle and others trying to take y'all to. That right there in this next picture, I want to pause. Oh, did I already go? That's, that's Lorraine a hotel where Dr. King got assassinated at. The one I really wanted to tell y'all was the one where the young man got lynched. See, we scared to show young folk pictures, but they have more access to stuff on their phone than we, and we need to keep it real with them. Over 3,000 young men got lynched. And those were just the noted accounts for doing nothing. I forgive the country, but I'm going to tell my story. I could the, the kind of mentality I got, I'd have probably got lynched. I probably wouldn't have made it past 16, 17, because I'm like going, yo, what, 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 bro? Nah, uh-uh, no, and then they'd have lynched me. Y'all see that? Denied justice. That guy, the short guy right there, that's Walter Fontroy. He was a man that walked with Dr. King. That's Walter Fontroy. Right there, that's the late, great Roosevelt Cole and Gracie Cole. And my grandparents, hallelujah! That's where it all got started. That's, late. that's Rosie Sutton. That's her mama right there. And that's Mike right there. Looking dapper, looking dapper, looking dapper. This is my story. But this is our story. And that's Rosie with all her sisters. She on the end. And all those three right there, they're all deceased. And it's only five left. And then it's my mother and a couple more in there. It's a part of my story. Y'all know who them peoples are? Who know who them peoples are? That's Gilfield. Come on, somebody. That was the last big picture we took of that great man right there. Rita was in there. Woo, Jesus. Look at that picture. James was in there. Come on, somebody. Giga. Reverend Birch was in there. They not here no more. Look at that. Woo. I'm, goodness gracious. I can't handle this. Pastor, when he got older, he would always say, I want to go see my brother. So I jumped in the car and said, let's go. And drove him to Fayetteville, North Carolina. And all he wanted to see was his brother. Look at that. They go Reverend Knight. Yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. Those are the two greatest men in my life. Because, because God allowed their story to intersect my story. That's, the, that's my sister Adele. That's her husband. Brother, they was married for seven. They're married for 70 years. 
70 years. That's crazy. 70 years, y'all. Keep on going. Keep on. I think it's at the end. Those are all the chairmen. He was the first chairman, then Steve, then Deacon James, and Deacon James is no longer here. And that's it. That's this. Come on, somebody. This is Guildfield history. This is our story. It's not just my story. This is your story. I would go visit Reverend Knight on his front porch, and he would have me. That's what he'd say, he, and he would tell him stories. I would just sit there, and he would just tell me all these stories and have me laughing forever. And that's Prince and Taj, because I said, you know what? I told them, you need to go see this guy. You need to be with him, because one day when I'm not here, you'll be looking at these stories, and you'll be telling your story. So I started at 35. Oh, I got, I got five more. All right, all right, all right. So, <laughs> got to be careful who you make balls. Man. You got to be careful, man. <laughs> Some people, man, they take it too far. They take it too far. So in our text, it's a text where the people of Israel, the black folk, were taken in exile, a.k.a. slavery. And the people who took them in slavery said, you know what? Sing some of them songs y'all was singing when y'all was coming over here, these boats. We heard y'all down there humming. What they didn't realize was that song that they were singing on a boat was the only thing that kept them connected with the country that they'll never see again. And it was also, watch me, it was also a song they sing because they kept them in. You, I got to take you to the black, the, 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 the black and Wax Museum where they show how they stack these slaves in boats. They were like on slabs of just one on top of the other, and they would have to release themselves. And they were basically undernourished. And if you were strong enough, and you had four to two, you could make it. But the majority of them died. So you would sit there, and there's rotten human corpses, and you're crapping. That is awful. That is inhumane. Yeah. And yeah. it's beyond inhumane to be a part of that. But I forgive America. Say, I forgive America, because that's important. And, um, they would sing, and it's in the singing, they was able to find strength to stay alive. That's why I say, why they say we all came from kings and princes? No, because I've been to Africa, all around Africa, and I'm like, the story that they say, but I understand now. Because in order to make it on that three, four month journey, with the minimum food they gave you, had to be something deeper and bigger in you. And so we, we were the best of the best. Because if you wasn't, you wasn't going to make it. You had to make it through suffering, through inhumane suffering, through a lack of water and a lack. And they would just throw them overboard and feed the sharks. And they got a book called The Middle Pass. There were millions upon millions of men and women who didn't make it, who they just threw over and, and they became shark bait. But that's not my story. That's not your story. My story is I made it over the ocean. And after three and four generations, I refused to talk to these senior members who I know lived in a time where white, black folk couldn't vote. Amen. And understand that because of what they did, the struggles that they withstood, the things that they stood, being called nigger and all kinds of things. And they, that's right, I said it because it was real. I got you. You got you. Mama Pastor said a bad word. Keep it real. Keep it real. And they made it over so that we can have opportunity to not only tell our story, but to sing our song. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that when I was in the choir singing them songs, when I would leave here and didn't know where I was going to spend the night at, pause, I never slept outside. I always had a friend who let me in their basement. Say amen, somebody. Amen. It, it wasn't the best situation, but guess what? I can look back and see that God's hand gave me favor in the amen. midst of my situation. Amen, amen somebody. And it was them songs that I was singing on Saturday and on Sunday that was vibrating life and fortitude and determination and perseverance in me that wouldn't let me cross over and do what a whole lot of my boys did. Killed folk, sold drugs, lost their consciousness, and became an aggravated assault on America. I remember a whole lot of friends. We got a whole lot of friends who died in that war. And I say, God, why didn't I go that way? He said, because... I was teaching you how to sing a song in a strange land. <laughs> and uh, 
as I learned to tell my story and learned that them songs that you singing, I was driving on Tuesday and I was just minding and that song came on and I just went, I was just seeing Jasmine <laughs> and up the, oh, y'all, making everybody sing and it just hit me. God says, I, she's depositing, I'm depositing Tierra, they're depositing power and music in you. That's your song that's singing to your soul, to your spirit. So when somebody look at that beautiful black skin and try to look at you like you ain't worth everything that God made you to be, that song's going to sing and rain out what you sensing. You might, they might not say it to you, but you are discerning it enough to know that when somebody's looking at you, they're not looking up at you, they're looking down at you. But the song that God put in your spirit, the song that he puts in your bosom will make you look at them and be like, who they think they are and just keep it stepping. And the reason why I could forgive America, just like I could forgive the knucklehead black dude who killed friends of mine and relatives of mine, because everybody white ain't my enemy and everybody black ain't my friend. My God, you say that, but because I got a savior named Jesus, I can forgive every last one of them. Because as long as I keep the savior first, my story become his story and my song become his song. And the story that he's telling, he's still writing. The guy that was homeless at 16 is past the Guilford Baptist Church. My God. That's right. The guy who was out there trying to wonder how I'm going to eat the next day, I could come to church, come on somebody, and sing a song and feed others. Because I discovered a savior along my journey named Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. He is sweet, I know. And he is in the black experience. He's in your black reality. And he wants you to know that your black reality, watch this, I'm great. Remember I told y'all, I told you, I said I had something that your mom and them didn't know. Ain't none of the adults know this. I'm great dropping, then I'm done. Jasmine say five minutes, I'm going to honor her so she can look me up and say, you did it, Pastor. Because it's hard to get her approval. So I'm going to work today. The reason why God wants you to know that when Jesus becomes your savior, he gets in your song. He gets in your story. And he helps you understand the reason why the most hated, tried race in the whole country is folk of dark color. Either we are a curse or we are an anomaly. I'm going to say an anomaly. That word Zion in all throughout that song. I looked up the, epi the, uh, what do you call it? The, ep the etymology, the original construct of the word Zion. It means Ethiopia. It mean, it mean, and, and, and I've been to Ethiopia. When you go to Ethiopia, that's the place where human life started. Ethiopia is a place where everybody black. I'm so they got, a, a, they got these bones there. I think is it Anna? What is it? What's the bones? The bones of the first human being was a black woman. They got a place in Ethiopia that they say conceivably could be where the Garden of Eden was. And so when you look at this black skin, God says, see, you let, don't let nobody tell your story. You get with me, I'll tell your story. And our story is an awesome story. And the half have not been told, and the best is yet to come. I'm done. It's five minutes. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. That's right, Jack. She, she over there count. She over there count. It's, it's your story. It's your song. But you're going to need a savior so he can help you tell it and sing it the right way. Amen. Amen. This guy right here. I'm over him. He was a big man. This guy right here. I wish y'all knew his story. The enemy tried to destroy him. And when he was in a position where most men will crack down, become Muslim and all of that, what was you doing? And how was you doing that? Song, singing. And the men in the destructive atmosphere he was in were coming in and say, man, what's them songs you singing? <laughs> See, because his grandmama then brought him to this place called Guilford Baptist Church. And he didn't realize that them songs that they made him sing when he was scared to sing would be the songs that when he was in the darkest hour of his life. Come on, bro. Holler at your boy. So God say, don't let nobody tell you your story because God want to tell you your story. Don't let nobody sing your song because God got a song that will sing you into your purpose and your destiny. But you got to stay connected with the Savior. And it got to be personal.
Young people, I love y'all. The greatest joy I got is seeing y'all. Because I know and they know the potential that you guys got. And Edward was up there. He didn't realize he's a prayer warrior. Amen. Edward and Chris went on a black history trip with us. We traveled all around and did every, every place that something significant happened from Dr. King's assassination to the uh, Selma. We went to all those places. And I make a commitment to y'all that by next year, I'm going to raise $10,000. And we're going to take our young folk on a black history exploit that's going to blow they... It's gonna, that's gonna blow your mind. It's gonna be, and so I'm asking all my parents, stop bringing your kids to church. We need them here. We're ready to get it cracking. I need y'all to help me and them understand what we need to do. We want every Sunday to be a Sunday that y'all come to, because God got a plan and purpose for your life. And as much as we're depositing you on this fourth Sunday, we got so much more we got to give y'all in a short time. So I need y'all to tell y'all parents we need to get cracking. Because past the 56, I'll be 57 this summer. I don't plan on holding to this thing for a long time. I want to be able to see some young man or woman come after me. And I want to make sure that in my time frame, I deposit in y'all what those great men and women and people deposited in me. And so I'm asking y'all to make up in your mind that you want to be young on purpose. Because with these young black skin you got, the world is going to offer you an option that only Jesus can show you he got other options for you. It offered all of us some options. And I thank God that I learned my story. I learned to sing the songs of Zion. And I had a relationship with the Savior that showed me that God had another way. Amen, somebody? And so we got to commit. We got to get our young folk back in church. And we got to have meetings around what do we need to do to get them in church. There's meetings out there talking about how to keep them away. So we need to have meetings, and I'm as your pastor will lend my ear. Whatever we got to do to get y'all and y'all friends here, I will do. Because ain't nothing more important than seeing y'all in here, learning your story, learning your song, and learning who your Savior is. Amen, somebody? Amen. Is there anybody here out of the ark of safety who don't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of their sin? What that simply means is you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I keep saying this, but I'm here to tell you. We say story, song, Savior. It all works when you got the Savior in place. Amen? It all works when you got the Savior in place. So I'm asking each and every one of y'all, consider your walk and relationship with Jesus. Just ask yourself a question. What, what is my relationship with Jesus? See, see, it was story, song, Savior, personal. It's personal. It's personal. And Jesus want to have a personal relationship with you. And if you don't, I want to invite you to come and I'll tell you in 15 seconds how to have a relationship with Jesus. And then he's going to start doing some weaving in your story. And he's going to start teaching you your song. You ain't got to sing like the angels, but God got a song that when you in your darkest hour, you will say it. Amen, somebody? You will say it. And all the black people in history that we, they, they couldn't read. They came over these boats trying to, they had, Africa still is the only country that have so many dialects they can't even name them all. They came to a strange land, didn't know the language, didn't know the country was put in slaves, but guess what they didn't forget? The songs of Zion. And God want to put his songs in you and songs in me. Because when all is said and done, guess what will work? Your song. Amen? Did you don't want, want, want it work? <laughs> Won't it work? <laughs> Young people, I love you. Gil Phil, I love you. We, we in for a ride, y'all. I need y'all to pray for your pastor because we got to go to a whole different level. Every meeting I'm having is about how do we keep this thing going higher and better. It ain't about more people. It's about us understanding how big our God is. And whether more people come or not, I've seen God do more things with few than he do with numbers. But if the people come, we'll deal with that problem. But right now, we deal with what we got. And we need to help our young folk and you remind you how big our God is. So that when you go back out into this crazy world, you got a God. See, when you sing songs about God, you make God bigger than your situation. That's why the songs are so important. Jail is real. The streets is real. People pointing guns at you is real. But when you say, how did I get out of that? <laughs> Amen. 
That's where the song begins to sing. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I come in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, thanking you for these, your people, thanking you for our young folks. Thank you for all those who I believe have grabbed this vision. I believe something amazing is happening and it's going to continue to happen. I pray that you give us all a desire, a deeper sense of desire to dig deeper and pray more so that we can cover and keep what you already putting in our hands and our spirits. Thank you, Lord God, for these, your people. Thank you for those who are on their way. But until they get here, I pray that we hold it down. We worship, we praise you, we exalt you, Lord God, we glorify you. And when people come in here, Lord God, they'll say, that's the place I want to be. Excuse me. And we thank you, Jesus, for Guilford Baptist Church. We love you and we exalt you. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Let everybody say amen. amen. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us false before the throne to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, majesty, power, both now, henceforth, and forevermore.